encode the incoming data, the X, um, at this point in time with the given limited compression algorithm that you have. For example, most of you know a lot about human faces. And, and that's because you saw so many of these faces and now you are carrying around with you some sort of prototype face which allows you to encode new faces in the visual field by just encoding the deviations from the prototype. So whenever a new face comes along and it looks very much like the prototype face, then you just need a few extra bits to store that new face. And, and your lazy brain likes that because it doesn't want to um, waste a lot of storage space. So um, the, the more the face looks like the prototype face, you could assume the fewer bits you need to encode it and um, the prettier, in a certain sense, you find it. This is just a word. We just count the bits that we need to store these, uh, the new incoming data. For example, uh, a face that is uh, very regular doesn't need a lot of bits to um, be encoded. All right. Now, the important thing is not the compression by itself, but the first derivative of the compressibility, because what's really going on is that as new data is coming in, your compression algorithm improves all the time. It improves all the time and becomes a better predictor of the data. Whatever you can predict, you can, you can, um, you can compress, because you don't have to store extra what you already can predict. So prediction and compression are almost the same thing. And, um, and to the extent that your learning algorithm is improving the predictor, such that it becomes a better predictor on the observed data so far, you are saving bits. Right, to the, you, you can count this progress in, in, in bits that you are saving. And that's the, interesting, the only interesting thing um, which, signifi which signifies that there's a novel pattern in the input stream where you still have some learning progress. So what you're interested in is, or what is the interestingness of some data X? Well, it's not the number of bits that you need to encode the data, but it's the first derivative, the change of the number of bits as your subjective learning algorithm based on your subjective previous knowledge, knowledge is improving the compressibility. So you have to count the number of bits that you're saving. And then, once you have that in place, and it's all, um, you can formally nail it down and implement it on uh, computers and robots, once you have that, then you just need an additional algorithm, an additional learning algorithm, a reward optimizing algorithm, which takes all these um, internal joy moments. And whenever you have, uh, whenever you save a few bits, it means you have a novel pattern and you count how novel it is by counting how many bits did you save. And that's an internal reward signal, an intrinsic motivation, an, an internal joy signal. And that's what you want to maximize for the future. You want your controller that is directing your arms and your, uh, your actuators to move such that you get additional data from the environment where you can still um, get additional types of compression progress of this type where your particular compression algorithm still can make this type of progress. And, this, and there are many reward maximizing algorithms and reinforcement learning algorithms that in principle can do this. And this is the basic principle, and I'm going to explain in the rest of my talk only how this explains uh, art and science and um, whatever. So, again, in discrete time, uh, the formulation without derivatives, if you don't like that. The simplicity or compressibility or um, beauty, if you want, of the data is the number of bits you need to encode it, given what you already know about uh, the data. But then, um, the interestingness of the data is the, the, the change in the number of bits. So, you get the data... You learn a little bit on it, which means you can now compress it a little bit better. So the raw data is like that. The compressed data is like that. Then you improve the compressor a little bit. It learns something. It becomes a better neural network that predicts the data. And now you, it takes so many bits. And this is what you save. And that's your internal reward signal, because you have a novel pattern which you didn't know yet. And that's why you find it interesting. And you can just uh, subtract the number of bits you needed before from the number of bits that you need afterwards, and that, there you go. So that's the reward signal. Give, let me give you an example, a very simple example of a robot sitting in a dark room. The input doesn't change. It sits there, and no matter what it does, it's always black, black, black. So it's extremely compressible input. But 
Because it already can predict that very easily, because you just can predict by saying the next frame is exactly like the previous one, you can totally compress the input, and it's totally boring because there is no compression progress, because you don't feel, uh, see a pattern that you didn't already know. Now let me give you an, another extreme example, which is just the opposite. Suppose you're sitting in front of a, of a screen with white noise, and there are all these black and white pixels coming with equal probability at you, conveying maximum traditional Shannon information or Boltzmann information, and still this stream of inputs is totally boring again because, yes, it's very uncompressible, you cannot find a short pattern, and you cannot improve your current description of the si signal, which again means that there is no compression progress. So this is also boring. The only thing that is interesting is stuff like certain types of music, which you didn't know yet, but which was maybe a little bit similar to what you already knew about music, and whether there's a new little harmony in there which, is, which you haven't heard just in this way, and there you have a little pattern where you save a couple of bits, and then what's that's what motivates you to listen to the same song again, once more. All right. So here we have, uh, again, a boring white noise and no internal reward for things like that. So a discovery in physics, for example, is just a very large uh, compression improvement. For example, suppose you have one million videos of falling apples and, and they all fall in the same way. It's always the same way they fall down. So you can... Um, when, you, when you're good, you extract the rule, the rule. You can extract the rule behind this behavior, and it turns out it's a very simple program that describes gravity essentially, and uh, it's always a very short um, uh, program that you can use again and again for all these many different um, videos of falling apples to greatly compress these. Um, orange blobs that are falling down there. You cannot compress everything. There are random fluctuations and noise and whatever that you can compress, but there's a substantial aspect of the incoming data that you can compress. And there, you can make a lot of compression progress, suddenly save a lot of bits. But the same is true also in the arts. Suppose there's a guy who um, found a, figured out a way of drawing Obama with just five lines such that everybody says, hey, that's Obama. So you... Um, you have an artist who somehow extracted the essence of, of the face such that you have the same impression as you're looking at, 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 at this face that you get when you are, um, when you are looking at a high-resolution photograph with a million pixels. So somehow there was a compression progress in the um, artist as he was trying many times to come up with a convincing caricature. And, um, and there is a similar thing happening in, in the observer when he sees that for the first time. So the scientists and the artists have something in common. They always try to make new data which is compressible in a new, previously unknown way. A new pattern, a novel pattern means, yes, it's compressible, but in a way that I didn't know yet, such that my compressor can make this um, learning progress and can save a couple of bits. You know, before I uh, came here, I thought that this is going to be just another singularity summit and probably there won't be much of an audience, but you are actually a large audience by my standards. <laughs> the other day I gave a talk and there was just a single person in the audience. <laughs> a young lady. I said, young lady, it's very embarrassing. But apparently today I'm going to give this talk just for you. And she, and she said, okay. But please hurry, um, I gotta clean up here. <laughs> we had a whole bunch of different implementations of the principle that I just explained. We didn't start that yesterday. In 1990, uh, the first systems of this type were implemented using very simple prediction machines, artificial neural networks. How many people know what is an artificial neural network? All right, okay. And so you can use them to become better predictors and better compressors of the data history. And then we had additional um, systems like that, but I don't even have the time to go through that. Um, I would like to mention, though, that recently uh, two guys in California, they took the 1995 model and, uh, and found that it explains um, eye movements of humans better than previous models. So why are you looking here and not there? Well, for some reason it's more interesting there than here. But what does it mean more interesting? Well, because this action of looking there leads to a new input which has some, 
which leads to some input pattern that has something interesting. Why is it interesting? Well, because there is something which you don't know exactly yet and where you can still make a little bit of learning progress. 